Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Calls Calls. This is the 2024 Masters Data Dive Show. It's also National Championship Night for men's basketball, so we'll be interested to hear from the community who you have tonight, UConn or Purdue, but we're not here for that. It's Masters Week. We're here for everything Masters Championship, Augusta National, players in the field this week. We've got you covered. We're going to be looking at the forecasts, prior performance at Augusta National, uh, perhaps a little bit of winter patterns uh, in anticipation for the research that I'll put out tomorrow. Everything you need to narrow down your research to nail this year's winner of the Masters and to optimize your DFS lineups. It's going to be a great show. Let's get right into it. All statistics provided tonight and every night are from FantasyNational.com. It is the best golf research tool out there for your money. There are a lot of great golf analytics tools out there. I simply believe Fantasy National is the best. It's going to give you everything you need at the power of your fingertips. You want to look at past performances. You want to look at rolling models, lineup uh, generators, everything that you need to ha be successful, whether that is in outright wagers or in DFS, uh, is available to you at Fantasy National. So go check out FantasyNational.com. You will not regret it. In the description to the video, there are links to all of the social media. First off, my ex and Instagram were normally on Mondays. I will post research, but I was out of town today playing a little bit of golf. Uh, yes, during the eclipse, but playing uh, some golf. So that research will come out tomorrow <laughs> on uh, previous winners of the Masters Championship, the pattern that they uh, share throughout the years uh, leading into their win, the players that fit that criteria in the field this week. So if you want to see the weekly research that I do on the PGA Tour, then give me a follow at your preferred social media site. X is also where I place my weekly betting cards and top player usage in the DFS contests I play. That comes out every Wednesday evening after the DFS Tactics Show. Speaking of Wednesday evenings, to round out the... Uh, social media uh, introduction here. Gabe's handle is in the description. He writes a very good article called The Fringe. It's a great way to start your preparation for the week, and he continues to provide you additional information throughout the week in his own way with recent form, course history. And the only way you're going to be able to get all of that is if you subscribe to his article, which is free to do, by the way, and as a bonus, to subscribing or for subscribing to his article. You're going to be able to join us in his Substack chat as we continue the DFS talk over in his Substack chat after calls, calls, and the DFS tactic show on Wednesday night. Uh, we talk about game theory, our favorite plays of the week, scary fades, uh, 6K and maybe 5K plays, although there's no 5K plays uh, at the Masters for the DFS this week. But our favorite low budget options, um, favorite area of the price boards, favorite pivots, everything that you need to optimize your lineups. Uh, we talk about wave advantages if we see any. So it's a great discussion over there. And again, the only way you're going to be able to participate in that is if you are a subscriber to his article. So show, go show Gabe some support. Subscribe to his article. It is free to do, by the way. And follow him over on social media. Lastly, for the for this intro, we are live. Chat's open. Had a lot of feedback from last night's show. Loved it. I want to hear from more of you all. Uh, still waiting to hear if anyone was also on Akshay Batia, uh, or if you've had success in the DFS realm. It doesn't have to be golf, uh, fantasy baseball, uh, fantasy soccer. However you play. DFS, if you're a member of the community, would love to be able to shout you out uh, at the beginning of weeks um, for all the success the community has. So um, jump into chat with all of the success that you've had. Um, and who's your pick this week for the Masters? Have you made any outright wagers? Uh, what's your research led you to today? Uh, how do you think Augusta National is going to play? Who do you have tonight in the national championship game, as I alluded to at the beginning of the intro? Are you on UConn? Are you on Purdue? Is your bracket still alive for any pools that you entered? Um, so would love the interaction this evening, but we're here for the Masters. So let's dig into the weeds of the data for the 2024 
Masters. And as we always do on a Monday evening, we're going to start over at Windfinder. Now, Wednesday evenings, we always look at the super forecast. A little bit too early in the week for that. We're just going to be looking at the extended forecast. But let me tell you, before I scroll down to it, it's chaotic. It's a mess. Thursday looks like a lot of rain in the forecast, potentially a washout, although there are sub-air systems underneath these greens, so they can dry out much quicker. Um, but, I mean, 20 mile an hour sustained winds, 40 mile an hour gusts, lots of wind in the forecast for Thursday, and the same amount of wind really in the forecast for Friday, just no precipitation. So lots and lots and lots of wind in the forecast for Thursday and Friday for the, for the cut portion. Now Saturday does taper off quite a bit in terms of wind. It looks uh, fantastic in terms of a Saturday at the Masters and then the wind picks up again on Sunday. But with this extreme amount of wind that's in the forecast, I cannot foresee this playing any other, anything other than difficult. Um, now, with the rain, it could be fairly soft, which is just going to increase the length of the course. Players are going to get absolutely zero rollout if, indeed, this uh, precipitation does, um, in fact, come into play. So there's a look at the forecast, the extended forecast. And, of course, we'll keep on top of this. I will update this at the beginning of the show Wednesday night, but I would highly suggest you stay on top of the forecast at Augusta National uh, for the week. No real wave advantage to try to take advantage or to try to exploit, if you will. Uh, players are going to be going off just in one wave uh, continuously off of hole one from Thursday morning. But uh, definitely something that we're going to want to factor in, especially um, with the with the wind players who have who has been good in the wind, who has not been good in the wind, and whatnot. So with that, we move to Fantasy National, and let me um, bring in the moderate and windy conditions, and I will have to extend the timeline as I have just the 2024 season filter on, so let me remove that. In the last 36 rounds and or the past two calendar years, our top performers in moderate and windy conditions have been Scotty, Rory, Victor Hovland, Patrick Cantley, Xander, Terrell Hatton, Wyndham Clark, Justin Thomas, John Rahm, and Jordan Spieth are our top 10 in terms of wind performance the past couple of years. If indeed that precipitation does manage to... Uh, come to fruition. I foresee this playing extremely long and we're already going to look or be looking at the long course filter anyway. So on long courses, those deemed over 7,400 yards per Fantasy National, in the past two years, our top performers have been Scotty, Akshay Batia, and you'll notice that the Valero has now been loaded into Fantasy National and Akshay Batia's just video game numbers, him and Denny McCarthy's, to be fair. Uh, both of their um, performances uh, skyrocket them in terms of long course performance and their video game numbers, but the Valero is in for this evening. So, uh, Scotty, Akshay Batia, Wyndham Clark, John Rahm, Xander, Sungjae, Max Homa, Rory, Corey Connors, and Sahit Tagala are our top 10 in terms of total performance on long courses the past couple of years. Of course, Denny McCarthy uh, catapulting all the way up to 12th. But as I mentioned when talking about the wind and seeing the forecast, I do not envision anything other than difficult, especially for the first two days um, and probably Sunday if that forecast holds. So in the past two years, our top performers, when rounds have been difficult relative to par, Scotty, Rory, Wyndham Clark, Victor Hovland, 
Will Zalatoris, Cam Smith, Patrick Cantley, John Rahm, Xander, and Tommy Fleetwood are our top 10 in terms of total performance when rounds have been difficult. Okay, um, going to change uh, the, the usual ordering of the show, if you will, for the Masters this week and the Data Dive show. Since the Masters, or a lot of the data at the Masters is proprietary, especially the strokes gained, we're not going to be looking at prior leaderboards, as I like to do that to gain a, uh, to get a, a feel for how important off the tee versus approach putting and whatnot is. We also don't have any proximity data, putting data. So some of the data is limited. We'll absolutely look at a detailed view of what data we can gather, uh, but uh, we are going to um, uh, stray slightly from the usual uh, format of a data dive show. So because of that, we're going to go ahead and cover the strokes gained categories, just the four major shot types in golf. Um, let me clear all these filters, last 36 rounds and the 2024 season. And of course, uh, as I mentioned last night, I will continue to mention it uh, throughout tonight and throughout the week. I do not look at anything live or DP World Tour. I focus solely on the PGA Tour, so you will see players like John Rahm and Brooks and Joaquin Neiman uh, not rate out as highly for me because I do not collect live data, don't collect DP World Tour data, focus solely on the PGA Tour. So in the 2024 season, since the century, our top off the tee players in the field this week, Scotty, Rory, Xander, Siwoo Kim, Chris Kirk, Ludwig Ober, Sahit Tagala, Cameron Young, Wyndham Clark, Corey Connors, and Akshay Batia are our top 10, technically top 11 with ties. Top approach players in 2024, Scotty, Corey Connors, Lucas Glover, Tony Finau, Shane Lowry, Austin Eckroat, Akshay Batia, Nick Taylor, Justin Thomas, and Cameron Young. Our top around the green players in 2024, Hideki, Scotty, Lucas Glover, Xander, Siwoo Kim, J-Day, Denny McCarthy, Terrell Hatton, Adam Shank, and Taylor Moore. We'll round this out with putting. I will remove the 2024 filter as we are needing to look at bent and specifically lightning bent greens. So on lightning bent greens in the past two years, our top putters have been Denny, Denny McCarthy, Harris English, Terrell Hatton, Eric Cole, JT Poston, Cam Smith, Victor Hovland, Patrick Cantlay, Minwoo Lee, and Danny Willett. Okay, there's a look at our top strokes gained uh, major shot type performers in the four major shot types. And we might come back to this a little bit um, if we think we want to look at difficult relative to par, um, perhaps some uh, long course metrics or whatnot. But let's go ahead and jump to Microsoft Excel fairly quickly here. And let's take a look at the uh, at, at Augusta National in terms of some raw data to give you a perspective of how Augusta National typically plays. So what we have here going back all the way to 2012, which is the furthest back Fantasy National goes, and a reminder that you will see that the 2020 Masters was skipped. I am not including Dustin Johnson's fall win because it is such a, an enormous outlier in terms of other Masters tournaments. I mean, most obviously it was played in the fall. It was pretty easy. Just a lot of things that aren't congruent to other Masters championships. So I'm just not including it in my sample size, whether that's you know finishing position, any stats from it, I, I'm just not considering it. So be aware of that. As I go through this, 
in the back of your mind, understand that I'm not including that tournament. When we look at, we'll start with driving distance, since we don't have any of these strokes gained categories. We start with the driving in greens page view in Fantasy National. It has played all the way back to the to 2012 as a 12.2. Uh, past couple of years has been pretty solid. Now in 2021, when Hideki won, uh, distance did not matter at all. And we can go look at some of these prior leaderboards if the community is so interested. Uh, you see in 2019, when Tiger won, distance was a big factor. So you see the Masters and Augusta National has played to an average of 12.23 over the past, uh, what's this, 11 years? Yeah, would be 11 years now. We didn't have the data for 2017. And this number here is the full field course average on the PGA Tour. So you can see uh, it's about 50% higher. So distance does contribute uh, quite a bit to upper leaderboard success. Fairways does not. However, last year was a major factor. But you see it's a pretty high outlier. Uh, no year before or since 2015 had fairways contributed to one full shot in terms of strokes gained, um, but last year was a three. So I'm willing to throw this out <clears throat> as an outlier and just say that fairways generally aren't that big of a deal, uh, and they generally aren't here. These fairways are very wide. They're, they're pretty forgiving. Um, if you're missing the fairways, uh, you're in you're in either you know water or the pine straw, uh, and that presents a whole lot of other problems. But these fairways are one, are some of the most generous in terms of width on the PGA Tour. Good drives gained, you see, plays to roughly average, a little slightly higher than the full field course average, although it was a huge factor last year. But I want to really really bring your attention here to the greens. Just some astronomically high numbers. Now, we do have one pretty low one here in 2017, but you see greens last year for John Rahm's win, 4.3, <clears throat> 3.8. I mean, the, this number in of itself would be some of the highest on the PGA Tour, 3.9. You had a five all the way back in 2015. It plays to an average of 3.9, nine or excuse me, eight tenths, eight tenths of a shot for the best finishers at the Masters, those who average or those who finish in the top 30. So greens is a major, major factor. Hitting these greens are very, very difficult. So if you're hitting these greens, you're gaining an incredible amount on the other players. At the Masters. So there's a look at Augusta National in terms of the raw data behind uh, the driving distance, fairways, greens, and whatnot. So bear with me as I continue on through this evening. We're going to switch back and forth between Fantasy National and Microsoft Excel. But let's go ahead and move to the Fairways and Greens page view in Fantasy National. Looking at the last two years, let's take a look at uh, probably long courses, especially with the rain and the wind. Um, the, <clears throat> the courses moan from green to tee uh, to minimize rollout as it is anyway. We saw the distance is a pretty decent factor. So on long courses, the last two years, our top driving distance players, Rory, Cam Young, Nikolai Hoygaard, Wyndham Clark, Ludwig Ober, Minwoo Lee, Adam Scott, Ben On, Gary Woodland, and Joaquin Neiman are our top 10 in terms of driving distance on long courses the past couple of years. Um, if, see, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to put or look at distance when it's difficult because these fairways are pretty generous. This is more, the difficulty of Augusta National more so comes into the second shots and the around the green 
where I would think about looking at driving distance when it's difficult is say like the U.S. Open, the PGA Championship, places of that maybe maybe Quail Hollow and the uh, and the Wells Fargo. I'm a little bit hesitant to look at driving distance when it's difficult. I, I more so like the idea of looking at distance on long courses this week. But something we will absolutely use on this page view when it's difficult is greens. We saw just how much greens gained is a is a big factor when we looked at the raw data in Microsoft Excel. So in the past couple of years, your top greens and regulation gained players when rounds have been difficult to par. Scotty, Xander, John Rahm, Tony Finau, who's been pretty darn good at the Masters, Gary Woodland, Patrick Cantley, Wyndham Clark, Shane Lowry, Colin Morikawa, and Victor Hovland. Uh, we could also look at greens on long courses. Uh, even though we don't have proximity data, there's quite a few approach shots uh, that will come from 175 plus just due to the fact that we have so many par fours that are over 450. And we've got several par fives that if the players try to attack them in two, particularly the... Um, short-ish par 5 13th and the par 5 15th is generally attacked in two as well sometimes um, I'm trying to think the uphill the uphill par 5 I believe on the front nine I believe is eight I could be wrong with that so don't don't at me just feel free to correct me in chat don't get don't get angry um, but uh, if a player is attacking these par fives, then uh, you're going to have some approach shots from from quite quite a quite a distance. So your top greens gained players on long courses the past couple of years: Scotty, Corey Connors, Wyndham Clark, Xander, Tony Finau, Gary Woodland, Nikolai Hoygaard, Akshay Batia, Max Homa, and Shane Lowry. Um, the only other thing I can think of, which ties heavily with the around the green, I don't know if I'm going to factor this or have this specifically in the mixed condition model, but we can absolutely look at some scrambling. Uh, and particularly when scrambling or, or when rounds are difficult. Uh, your top scramblers, when rounds have been difficult to par the past couple of years, Tommy, Denny McCarthy, Max Homa, Brooks, Patrick Reed, Adam Shank, J Day, Sam Burns, Cam Davis, Matt Fitzpatrick. Again, I'm more so thinking of just around the green in general, but if you wanted to look specifically at scrambling, um, there you go. So I will get this ready for scoring as we take a look and go back to Microsoft Excel. Let's take a look at scoring at Augusta National through the years. So you see Eagles gained. There are a few, but they have not been too prevalent the past couple of years. They were very prevalent for Hideki's win, Tiger's win, 2018. It's escaping me at the moment. I should know this. I'm going to have to cheat. 2018. Uh, Pat Reed, Patrick Reed. So um, a few Eagles, but really kind of average uh, at least compared to the full field uh, course average full field course on the PGA Tour instead it's all about the bogey avoidance pars are generally great scores at Augusta National except on the par fives I mean 4.19 that's some of the biggest numbers I've seen in this metric 4.25 very rarely and I mean very rarely will the birdies gained outweigh the bogeys avoided. Uh, here in the mid mid 2000 teens, they did, but almost every other year has been a pretty, especially last year, a, a very significant advantage to avoiding bogeys as opposed to birdies gained. But most of the time, it's a it's a decent advantage, um, or or a lean, if you will, to bogey avoidance 
as opposed to the birdies gained. You see the birdies gained is actually less than the full field course average on the PJ Tour, and the bogey avoidance is much higher. Again, just emphasizing, pars are good scores around Augusta National. So our top bogey avoiders, uh, let's take a look at, uh, yeah, I like to do difficult relative to par. So as a statistician, as a data analyst, my preference is to make things uniform, meaning to compare as best as we can apples to apples, which means looking at a scoring metric like birdies gain, bogey avoidance, birdies are better with a scoring filter like easy to par or difficult relative to par. This is my preference. I don't always stick to it, but 90% of the time I try to use the, the combination of a scoring metric and scoring filter to keep it uniform. So in that case, our top bogey avoiders when rounds are difficult, Scotty Scheffler, Terrell Hatton, Tommy Fleetwood, J-Day, Wyndham Clark, Matt Fitzpatrick, Rory, Xander, Victor Hovland, and Hideki. Now, a lot of this makes a lot of sense. Scheffler, winner in 2022. J-Day's been pretty good here, if I recall. Wyndham Clark's a debutante. Rory's been, uh, still looking for the Grand Slam. Xander's been pretty good here. Hideki, a former champion. But this could be a slightly misleading. Terrell Hatton has not been very good here in his um, tries at Augusta National. Uh, I would have to go and look at Fitzpatrick just very, very quickly. Uh, Fitzpatrick's eight aver uh, played it eight times, averaged a 26 finish. Okay, I mean, that's, that's solid. So pretty decent correlation there between performance and and or you know overall performance and bogey avoidance but it's also quite um quite legitimate to look at bogey avoidance on long courses and that's what we did for the valero last week so when courses are long the past couple of years our top bogey avoiders scotty xander J Day, wyndham clark akshay batia denny mccarthy adam shank russell henley Matt Fitzpatrick and Shane Lowry are our top 10 in terms of bogey avoidance on long courses. And I can comfortably tell you, come Wednesday night, bogey avoidance will be in the mixed condition model. More than likely, it will have the difficult relative to par filter, but I could also see myself switching to and or uh, using on long courses as well. Just because we've, you know, we saw in Microsoft Excel just how important bogey avoidance has been here at Augusta National over the years. Okay, <clears throat> moving to par threes. Now, yes, it is showing that they have <clears throat> slightly bit more significance in terms of importance, but <clears throat> I want you to focus on the one point five six versus the par fours, which are a 4.82, versus the par fives, which are a 2.12. So more than a half a shot importance, or close to a half a shot more importance on the par fives than they are the par threes. So with that in mind, the par threes aren't going to carry a whole lot of significance in the final mixed condition model. If we look at a particular range, we see that the 225 plus and the 150 to 175 are pretty darn even. And then the 175 to 200 is, is really falling off or, or trails behind the other two lengths. Having said that, this is still roughly about half, maybe a little bit more, more close to like 55% in terms of total par three performance. Now, the past few years, 0.9 or 0.95 out of a 1.85, that's 50%. 0.55 out of a 1.2 is less than 50%, less than 50%. So none of these ranges, or excuse me, none of these specific ranges are demanding looking at them by themselves. 
So my best inclination two or three days away from the from the tournament is to look at par threes in total. I would think if there is a range, you would want to look at the 150 <clears throat> to 175. I think that is where I would have my focus if you wanted to look at a range. I just don't think it's correct, especially since, as I get this prepared for the par threes, especially because only two of the four fall into there. We still have these two um, and like one, uh, 155, that's that's pretty well going to play in that 150 to 175 bucket, but you have 170, par three sixteenth. That easily can stretch beyond that 175 boundary. So I just, I don't feel comfortable looking at this range as the most important or looking at it solo. Um, so with that, and again, they won't have a lot of significance, but I think they will have, you know, a, probably 5% if I had to guess, because I want to focus on other things in the mixed condition model, but you will have to play the part threes somewhat decently, I suppose. So our top total par three performers in the field this week at the Masters, Denny McCarthy, Matthew Pavone, Adam Hadwin, Emiliano Grillo, Rory, Matt Fitzpatrick, Ryan Fox, Kurt Kiyama, Austin Eckert, and Ricky Fowler. Those are our top 10 par three performers in 2024. Now let's go to the par fours and the par fives, which are going to have more significance. And I do think we're gonna be able to narrow down a few things here. So we move to the par fours, and again, remember this is a 4.8, which is more than three times the par threes. So the par four is carrying significant, significant amount um, to our top performers year over year at Augusta National. The one low outlier here in 2021 from Hideki of 4.05, but 5.3. You know, 2015, almost a six on the par fours. Just huge, huge amounts of, uh, of significance here. If there is a range, I want you to look right there. 3.46 average out of 4.82. Uh, I'll bring up the, the calculator because I'm not going to be able to do that that quickly in my head. So 3.46 out of 4.82, 72% of the strokes gained in par fours come in this 450 to 500 range. Just a lot, a lot here. Now, last year they were fairly equal, but look at Scheffler's win two years ago. A heavy significance in the in the four feet to five. Look at the significance in Tiger's win. So, I don't think it. I, I I'm going to be looking at all par fours, absolutely. But there will be added significance or an added percentage looking at just the four fifty to five. And I think that's perhaps where we could find maybe some unique players that are very good from this range. If we're playing some DFS, I think this is an area where we could try to find some uniqueness, find some players that maybe some others aren't looking at and hoping they perform to their baseline in being good at this range of par fours. So as we go back to Fantasy National, our, nope, par fours. Our top par four performers in 2024 have been Scotty, Xander, Shane Lowry, Akshay Batia, Peter Malnati, Chris Kirk, Wyndham Clark, Ludwig Ober, Brian Harmon, Siwoo, and Matthew Pavone. Specifically from 450 to 5, Scotty, Hideki, Xander, Rory, Akshay Batia, Shane Lowry, Tony Finau, Ludwig Ober, Nick Taylor, and Wyndham Clark. So quite, 
quite a bit of overlap here between the par fours in total and the specific range. But, you know, Hideki tied for first among par fours in this range, just outside the top 10 in terms of total par fours. Rory is quite middling in this field with his par four performance, but has been very good at that specific range of par fours. Tony Finau, good, 20th in total, but top six in the specific range. Nick Taylor been good, but great at the specific range. Players like that, perhaps they get overlooked come Wednesday night when we look at projected ownerships and whatnot. Maybe we can exploit a little bit of this in DFS since they've been good in 2024 from 450 to 500 yard par fours. All right, let's wrap up looking at the detailed data behind Augusta National with looking at the par fives. And much to the same as the par threes, I don't see a lot here. I wanna caution you about seeing this big number in the zero to 500, because all of the strokes gained for these years was put in there, even though the course didn't play to those lengths. Look at the past, what's this, seven years, six years? It's been in these ranges, in these two. And again, only one par five measures to this length, three of the four measures to this length, but they're pretty darn close in terms of hitting that 550 boundary. Now the past two years, if you want to try to go on a little bit of a, uh, or if you want to hedge a little bit, I guess, or play to the, to the most recent bias, then you would want to focus on the 550 to 600 because these two years have really um, elevated the importance of the 550 to 600 in terms of strokes gained, but before that, it was pretty balanced. So is this a new trend? Or is this kind of like a two year blip? I don't, I don't know. Because of that, I just feel confident that par fives are important, but if you're willing to take a chance and factor in players who are better at this length of par five than this one, that perhaps could gain you an advantage. But for me, I'm just going to be looking at total par fives since consistently year over year at Augusta National, they have been important. It's varied which length, but year over year, they have had significant importance. So with that, hopefully one of the last times we'll switch back and forth between the page views, our top par five performers in the field this week at Augusta, Scotty, Nick Dunlap, Wyndham Clark, Eric Van Royen, Minwoo Lee, Tony Finau, Xander, Will Zalatoris, Matt Fitzpatrick, and Patrick Cantley are our top 10 in terms of par five performance. Okay, we don't have the specific data around it, but I do want to bring in three putt avoidance. As we saw in the breakdown last night, just very quickly, how, how common three putts are compared to the tour average, as I try to squeeze right in the middle here. You know, 90% or there's nine-tenths of a three putt at Augusta National versus the tour average of about a half a three putt per round. So almost double the 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 chances or, or likelihood of it occurring. So three putts and lag putting is a is a very, very big factor around Augusta National. So in the past two years on uh, Bent and Lightning, our top three putt avoiders on lightning bent greens the past couple of years. Cam Smith, Danny Willett, 
Adam Shank, Will Zalatoris, Justin Rose, JT Poston, Sepp Straka, Lucas Glover, Rory, and Sam Burns. Okay. Um, normally, what I like to go to next is the early look file, and I think that's probably where we're going to go um, because now that we have seen some of the metrics that we think are going to play most important at Augusta National. We can look at this year's field. Oh, sorry, I need to change the page view. We can look at this year's field and see who has been best at those metrics in their career, or at least since 2012, at Augusta National. So we'll start with driving distance. We saw that that was a, a decent factor year over year at Augusta. So our top driving distance players Historically, at Augusta National specifically, Joaquin Neiman, Cameron Young, DJ, Bryson, Taylor Moore gained quite a bit of distance in his debutante year. Rory, Ryan Fox gained a lot of distance. Adam Scott and Minwoo Lee, Sam Burns, Tony Finau, Gary Woodland, but look at the lack of success that he's had, and we'll be able to to pinpoint why he's uh, lacked some success here momentarily. But he's gained distance. Scheffler, Rom, Will Z has been good. The other end of the spectrum, players who have not gained a lot of distance. Look at these poor performances. I mean, you can expect that from Ola Thalbel. Poston was quite middling. Mike Weir, Fred Couples, Brian Harmon has struggled at Augusta National. Not a big hitter. Now, Morikawa was a little bit different. He's been very solid here. He's never known for his length. Uh, it's been elite iron play. But he's kind of out of form with that. Sung Jay has struggled here. He's not necessarily the longest. Chris Kirk, much the same. He is three for four, but quite a middling average finish. Zach Johnson. Siwoo, five for six. Okay. Schwartzel's actually been pretty good here. Seven for 11, but has lacked some distance. But there are your top distance performers in their career, or at least I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say in their career back to 2012 at Augusta National. Definitely, <clears throat> definitely want to look at Greens, who has gained the most Greens. Not necessarily had the largest Green in regulation percentage, but Greens gained. We see Scotty. Tom Kim was elite at it last year. Jordan Spieth, 8 for 9 at gaining greens. And when you combine that with his uh, typically elite around the green game, that's why he has performed so darn well at the Masters. Justin Rose has been very good here. 9 for 11 has gained a lot of greens. He's just not taking himself out, the, out of the hole. Morikawa, a lot of that combined with the iron play. John Rahm and Will Zaltoris. Thorbjorn Olesen has played pretty darn well. Three for three. Average finish inside the top 25. Adam Scott is 11 for 11 since 2012 at the Masters. Connors is three for five. He's lacked, uh, he's, he's lacked some, some solid performance here. Xander, four for five. Sahit Tagala was okay with the greens. We'll scroll on down a little bit further here. Get you give you a look at players who have been a little bit more good to maybe middling in terms of greens. We'll go to bogey avoidance. Players who have avoided the bogey avoided bogeys the best at Augusta since 2012. Gosh dang it. Tom Kim only one year, Ryan Fox only one year. There's John Rahm and Scotty and Spieth. Ricky has avoided bogeys pretty darn well. He's got a pretty good track record around Augusta. Same for Matt Fitzpatrick. Hideki, 9 for 10. Wells Alatoris has averaged a fifth plate or inside a top five finish in his two tries. He's avoided double bogeys pretty well too. DJ. Sahith, Cam Smith, 6 for 6. Xander Morkawa, Phil Mickelson has avoided bogeys 
at a decent rate. Finau, five for five. Scott again, 11 for 11. So there's your top bogey avoiders at Augusta National. We're going to skip the par threes again. I just don't see them carrying a whole lot of weight. Par fours. And I would look at 450 to 500, but there's still plenty I want to show you uh, in terms of potential research. So we're just going to look at par fours and par fives. So our top par four performers, look at that. Will Zalatoris, he's been electric in his two years at Augusta National. You see what he's doing on the par fours, just destroying them. John Rahm, defending champion, has destroyed these par fours. Spieth, Rose, Scotty, champions here at Augusta National, destroying these par fours. Hideki, Adam Scott. Now, J-Day's been good. Eight for nine. Shane Lowry, a little bit less in terms of success. He's only four for seven, quite middling. Uh, his lack of performance on par fives is probably contributing to the, to the high missed cuts here. But uh, he's been okay at the par fours. Brooks, Morikawa, Fitz and Fowler again. Henley, Rory, Victor. First time he's been up extremely high in a category. And then lastly, we'll look at par fives. Par five performance. What did I do there? What in the world? Par fives. Tagala only one time, but he did he he definitely played them extremely well last year. Scotty, Tony, Victor, John Rom, Fowler, Burns a little bit less in terms of success and sample size. Spieth again. There's Brooks. Rory. Gosh dang it. Rory. Thorbjorn Olison has played these par fives pretty well. Phil Mickelson. DJ. Patrick Reed. You see these, these champions performing at the par fives. Look at that. Amateur Stu Hagestad. He's actually performed pretty well on the par fives. He is one for two at making the cut here as well. So perhaps an amateur, you can think about uh, wagering top am or throwing in a lineup in DFS. Cam Smith, so on. Okay, I'm going to bring this back to the best average finish. We're going to round the data, data dive show off with uh, normally would be the research that I do on a Monday, but... Since I have not done that, I was out of town today, we're going to take a preview. We're going to get a, a first look at some of the research that I'm going to do later tonight and tomorrow before I post it to social media. Now, one of the things that I did have a quick, and admittedly a very quick look at, let's take a look at the previous winner's prior form coming into the Masters before they won. Now, any highlighted row or, or uh, tournament highlighted in blue here was both long and difficult. And how I justified that is that at least two of the four rounds of that tournament were difficult or difficult relative to par according to Fantasy National and they were over 7,400 yards. So the Arnold Palmer typically long and difficult. Farmers, typically long and difficult. There are some exceptions. 2022, it was more average than difficult. Um, the Genesis, when Tiger won, was actually long and difficult that year. This is the only year the Genesis played over 7,400 yards. Um, but that's what these highlighted uh, tournaments are in blue. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the performance here. John Rahm had a top 10. Scotty Scheffler won. Uh, Hideki had a top 20. And a top 30, to be fair, but, you know, top 20. Top 15. Top 25. The WGC Cadillac used to be played at, at uh, Trump National Doral. Uh, the Blue Monster. Uh, very long, generally difficult. Danny Willett was good there. You see a top 20 from Spieth, a runner-up and a top 15. So players have been good 
good to great, maybe even win, although Scotty was the only win. Uh, but they've generally been okay at these long and difficult tournaments leading into the Masters. So with that, we'll go back to Fantasy National. Let's take a look at uh, in 2024. So I clicked that. Let me clear all the filters. Go 2024. We want to look at long, over 7,400 yards. And we want to look at difficult. And there won't be very many rounds. My guess is maybe 10, yeah, not even 10, 7. So Ober, who played the Valero, played the Valero, Arnold Palmer, and one of the rounds at the Farmers. Okay. But generally, they've been good at these long and difficult tournaments. Uh, let's see, Hideki, probably the Valero, Arnold Palmer, Farmers. Uh, Rory's got six rounds. Arnold Palmer, Valero. So my guess is we're probably looking at those three tournaments in 2024. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. We're going to start with the Farmers. That was the first tournament in 2024 that was both long and difficult. And you see, I wouldn't even include it really in the sample size because only one round was difficult. It was a more so an average difficulty tournament. But since we're here, we'll take a look at it because it's definitely a long course. Here are your top, uh, just as a refresher, here's how that leaderboard shook out. Pavone, Hoygaard, Knapp, Jaeger, Finau. Oh, gosh dang it, I clicked on him. I did not want to do that. Apologies. Uh, Xander, Ober, Homa, Hideki, Batia, Will Zaltoris. So we'll look at probably top 15, maybe top 20 or so. So, you know, there's some names, although I would not weight this as heavily because, again, this wasn't as difficult as, as normally what the Farmers is. Let's take a look at the Arnold Palmer. If I could spell. Arnold Palmer 2024. Definitely would include this in my uh, data set and sample size. Three of the four rounds were difficult. Every single round over 7,400 yards. Let's take a look here. Scotty Scheffler ran away with it. Wyndham Clark. Shane Lowry. Henley. Sal Torres. Sahita Gala. I don't Remember Brendan Todd being in this? I could be wrong. Ben On, Max Homa, Justin Thomas, Harmon, Hideki, Nick Taylor, Cam Davis, Sung J, Corey Connors. There's some of the play those are the players that are top 20 on that long and difficult tournament. Yes, it was a signature event, so not everybody was in it, but Let's look at like some of the people that missed the cut. Fitzpatrick, that killed me that week because I was all over Fitzpatrick. Tommy did not play. Adam Scott and Justin Rose. Adam Shank, Kirk Kiyama. Hoygaard missed the cut. Colin Moore Cobble missed the cut. So perhaps not in the best form on these long and difficult courses. Last one, of course, was last week. The Valero. Long and played very difficult for the first three days. Akshay and Denny, of course, but Rory played well. Russell Henley played well. Shank, Fleetwood. So a little bit of conflicting um, conflicting results there. Hideki has played both well, API and this. Spieth, Fitz. Obear has been in all three of these tournaments and been a top performer at all three of these tournaments, even if you want to include the Farmers. Adam Scott's in there. So take a, take a long look at those players, considering that they fit some of what previous 
champions have done playing long and difficult well. Let's just take a quick look at overall last bit of uh, total you know, like performance leading in. John Rahm, exceptional. Several top fives, including three wins. Scotty Scheffler had two wins before he comes to Augusta National that year. Couple, uh, you know, another top twenty and top twenty-five. Now Hideki didn't have any wins, excuse me, but a top twenty, top fifteen, and a top twenty. So he's still in good form coming in. Tiger was in good form coming in, a top ten, top fifteen, and a top twenty. Patrick Reed was in great form. Two top 10s, including a runner-up, another top 20. Top 15s, top 25. So great, great <clears throat> form coming in. That's something that I'm not going to be able to highlight specifically this evening. I will have that on social media. But I'm looking at <laughs> perhaps top 20s, multiple top 20s, maybe even top 15s. Although i got to see how many fit that criteria of having multiple top 15s because Hideki only had one. He would fit more so in the multiple top 20s, but that, I'm thinking that's where I'm going to be at. But let's look at some you know, more recent data and some uh, master-specific performance. So we're going to start with the what I call the winner matrix, gathering what a player did at Augusta before they won, like, of course, Hideki has played since then, Scotty and, and Bubba. <clears throat> I'm only interested in what they had done at Augusta before they won. John Rahm, fantastic. Several top 10s. Scotty Scheffler was, had been good. Top 20 as a debutante, another top 20, and then also wins. Hideki had a couple of top 10s, another top 15, and another top 20. Tiger, no explanation needed. I mean, several of them going further back than 2010. Patrick Reed even had a top 25. Sergio had been good. He did miss one cut, but he had been good. Now, Danny Will, a slight bit of an outlier here. He only had a T38 and then wins, but he had an amount of success. Jordan Spieth, runner-up, then win. Bubba Watson, generally been pretty good, just had spike performances. Scott had been good. So, past success at Augusta, and I know a lot of people mention, you know, past success, but I'm just confirming it. <coughs> Excuse me, confirming it for you all. Past success is a pretty big indicator at Augusta. Let's take a look at performance the event prior, not necessarily the week prior. And in fact, take a look at some of the layoffs that people had had. John Rom didn't play for a month. Scotty hadn't played since the players. Now, Hideki played the week prior at the Valero. Since the players, since the Arnold Palmer, since WGC Mexico, most of these players, with the exception of 2015, which was Danny Willett? Yep. No, Spieth. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> with the exception of Spieth and Hideki, most of these players had had not just one week off, but several weeks off. John Rahm didn't, have, didn't play for a month, at least on the PGA Tour. Again, I only collect PGA Tour stats. So, they might have had a DP World Tour... It might have had a, yeah, I don't think the match play, the match play would have been in there somewhere too, uh, in here. But time off, time off, week prior, time off, time off, time off, time off. Uh, big thing. The only thing is Spieth and Hideki played the week prior. Almost everybody else had some time off before winning the Masters. So perhaps you want to be a little bit more cautious on uh, players who played um, at the Valero, perhaps. 
Let's take a look at some per specific performance. Like, nobody missed the cut in their event prior to the Masters. So, extreme recency form. Also a big deal. Look at the off the tee, only two players negative. Look at the around the green, only one player negative. And he was field average. So the around the green, again, heavy emphasis of around the green and around the green form coming into the Masters. Only one player negative in driving distance, and he was a negative .3, which is essentially field average over four rounds. So driving distance, form, or gaining distance coming into the Masters. Surprising, I would have thought this was bogey avoidance, but look at the birdies gained. I think that's a little bit more of a coincidence, but so be it. Um, nothing else really stands out aggressively as extreme correlation here. Most of these have at least you know three players that were negative, but um, just really quickly, again, driving distance, 11 of the 12, or excuse me, 10 of the 11, positive, the, the event prior. Around the green, 10 of the 11, <clears throat> positive. Off the tee, 9 of the 11. On top of not missing a cut, on top of majority of them had a prior top 25, at least at the Masters, if not more. Um, Patrick Reed, one of those exceptions. Perhaps Danny Willett, an exception. So, you know, multiple... Top 25 finishes, I'm guessing. On top of winter form of, you know, being in good recent form, multiple top 20s lately, the the list is not going to be long by the time all of that criteria uh, gets filtered through. But I wanted to give you a first look, if you will, at the research that I will be posting to social media tomorrow. So if you want to see the results of that research, uh, I, I ask you consider following me over on social media or at least look for that tomorrow. I will make sure to post that tomorrow. But that's going to be it for the Data Dive show this evening. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, watching and listening, supporting the channel by liking the video, commenting, subscribing. I always appreciate the support. I wouldn't be able to do this without your all's support and and by you all doing that. I love what I do, taking an in-depth look at sports statistics, giving you a statistician and data analyst view of what he sees, trying to help us all win a little bit of money in the process. Again, reminder, my research will be out tomorrow. Uh, go uh, follow Gabe over on social media. Subscribe to that article. It is free to do, by the way. Um, you're really missing out if you're not uh, doing that already. And if you're going, and if you do that, if you subscribe to his article, you're going to be able to join us in his Substack chat Wednesday night after the, uh, the DFS Tactics Show, um, which is at the usual time, 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight. So thanks again for all the support, for all the wagers you've made so far for the Masters, for all the wagers you're thinking about making this week for the Masters. And until I see you Wednesday night for the DFS Tactics Show. May all your bets be profitable.